Hi, and thanks for joining us on today's show. Something really special. We've got Bob Thurman on, a uh, professor from Columbia and the first Western trained Tibetan monk uh, trained by the Dalai Lama, buddy of the Dalai Lama. Uh, we had a wonderful conversation. Here's my chat with Bob Thurman. New Yorker, Bob, thanks for joining us. Uh, I guess from, well, from Woodstock today. Uh, i uh, thrilled to see you again. We saw each other recently in Miami. Yes. And uh, I just wanted to begin this chat with uh, a, a mantra that you taught me in the group I was with. Can you just can you just say it again, just for people just tuning in, just to hear the mantra? It's a, I think it's an important thing for people to hear. Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Swaha. That's the mantra. And you and taught us how to say it. The Om part is the general. Om Tare. Om Tare. Om Tare. Tu Tare. Tu Tare. Ture. Ture. Swaha. Swaha. That's it. And Tara is the name of, it's a Sanskrit word connects to the word for a star and it, and it connects to a word for a, a boat boatman ferrying you across an ocean and so it means it's a female a noun a name and it's the name of a female buddha who or a bodhisattva it doesn't matter who saves people from suffering which they which they, they do not just by but they sort of carry you in a boat across a dangerous uh, body of water with a crocodiles and monsters in it and uh, and uh, so you're calling her and she she as a female she's more energetic and active it's the indian idea of shakti of females she has more energy and courage and activity than males who we're all a little scaredy cat actually unless we have a gun or something <laughs> and females are very courageous because they deal with life in a more realistic manner and they could they are confronted by it in a more realistic manner and uh, so she's like a female Buddha, that's sort of the one we think of as a male Buddha. And then you can call her in the Indian ancient belief. Hindus also have the same belief, doesn't matter, Hindu Buddhists. And then she will immediately come and save you if you're being eaten by a tiger, a lion, assaulted by cobras, robbers, um, fires, floods. Whatever the, whatever the disaster. Eight different disasters which relate to eight different internal states of being overwhelmed by negative emotions. You know, so there's eight inner things and eight outer things. And but probably there's eight secret things that I can't even think what they are at the moment. But they always have this kind of... As somebody once said beautifully, oh, Christians love God, but Indian religions people, especially Buddhists, they love lists. Like the eight this is and the six that's <laughs> the it's four more, noble truths, yes. Yeah, yeah. The four four friendly fun facts. The four friendly fun facts. We'll get into those. Yeah, we'll get into those, of yeah. course. So and there's so, the mantra so to protect. Anyway, so om tari tu tari turi swaha. If you're about to, if your car is about to go off a cliff, if something's about to happen, you go om tari tu tari turi swaha. The turi means quickly. Tari is calling her, please come. Tu tari means show up quickly, you know, please come quickly. And then swaha is all good, it means. It's like all hail, welcome, or, you know, it's, a, it's a, a, just a sound of a, approval, you know, praise and approval, swaha, swaha, like say good, literally, you know, all good. So, um tari tu tari turi swaha. So, but the real month, the real summoning is um tari tu tari turi. And om means invoking the presence of all enlightened beings, because the Buddhist universe is filled with goodness. And uh, and in a way, I think the Indian one as a whole, and uh, there are bad guys and bad actors, but the good ones are much stronger. Is the idea, you know? And so so they're the default, in other words. So then, even if you if you die, you it's semi good actually. I should stop railing against materialists, because it's semi good in case what happened to you when you die is that you become nothing. Because at least that's being anesthetized. Like if I'm having open heart surgery, I like to be unconscious. <laughs> Definitely. Yes, yes so absolutely. So it's like eternal anesthetization. So that's better than worrying about hell or devils or horrible things that might happen to you when you die. And, um, you know, being eaten by the alien or something. But on the other hand, it's even better if the default is a sort of humming infinite reality of the life force mm. so that the, the default reality is is bliss 
and life. And then in case you had the inkling to do something fun, you would be embedded in this life force that would be infinitely amenable to whatever you want. Wow. So that's the better. That's that's like having your cake and eating it too. Is that, so, it, and it, that it, is a that's that's a happy way to live, actually. It's a wonderful way to live in this life and the next and the, the one before and the I, one after, I, right? Exactly. And uh, it, it's even so extravagant. They say, and I don't claim fully to have that vision, but I sort of have had hints. But they say that when you reach such a state, uh, or rather put it this way, you you discover that you are such a state already, big anticlimax in one way, in another way, big delight and relief. But when you discover that, you instantly remember all previous things that happened to you, which we forget because they are often have an element of quite unpleasantness about them. As we suffered, we died in prison, previous life. We had, which was a bad, we, we didn't want to, you know, we were afraid of it and so on. But when you get that view, all moments of time, past and future, you can remember and be aware of and anticipate and without breaking the joyfulness. The, the joy and living in joy, right? Because Bob, so that's a, I mean, not... it might be completely crazy and totally unrealistic. I'm still not 100% sure. But I'm ninety nine percent sure. You're not. You can say you're ninety nine percent sure, right? So when or do you need to know one hundred percent? I don't quite know. Do you have any memories of, re of rebirths, sure. or do you have any? Do you have well, any inklings of times? Well, I don't know. They didn't invent like a kind of a permanent MDMA or whatever it might be. So any kind of bliss thing it's, it's not yet been invented that I know of. But yet my own system is that. And therefore there must be, you know, maybe the adrenal glands or something, the brain, some kind of understanding, some form of reasoning, some encounter with something. I don't, I'm not sure, but I, I sort of know I'm very lazy because I think when you get 99% sure, you get a little complacent, I think, and you get lazy. And, um, you know, the closest I can come to it is, is, um, a Star Trek movie that I that uh, we've all seen, where they encounter where Kirk and the old fashioned Kirk and everybody, and Spock and they encounter Vidur. The good one, Vidur. You know that one? Did I tell that one in the story? No, you... no. Tell me, is it is, when you say that this is with uh, Captain Kirk? Yeah, and Captain Kirk and them, and they encounter Vidur, and then, but it was a movie. It wasn't in the episode episodal ones, and um, and then. Um, Vidur is devouring planets full of people and about to devour, devour the Federation planet. And it's some kind of, they don't, nobody knows what it is, but it seems to have a central control thing that's like a mechanism. And so they go and they land on the deck of this mechanism and they see V-G-E-R, like in letters, like so they think, wow, this might must have been sent out by us centuries ago or something, this thing, but it's turned rogue and it's going crazy. And then they talk, they figure out how to talk to it, and it speaks English. <laughs> That's a very sultry, sultry female voice. And they eventually discover that, well, it doesn't really mean to harm anybody. It just it wants to know everything. And it the last thing that it doesn't know, it's sort of like an early form of data. It doesn't know what it means to be a human being. So it keeps devouring them, thinking that it's going to find out what it is. So then... Frank Converse, who was a University of North Carolina drama student when I was 13 and 12 and used to do work in the summers at a restaurant in Nantucket. And he was there as an idolized college student. And also I was jealous and annoyed with him even because, of course, the girls who were 19 and 20 from different colleges and things, and I was only 12 and 13, but I was in love with them anyway. <laughs> I kind of lost out to the older guy. Early he, idol for you. Anyway, he was the actor of a one episode, obviously, or a one movie member of the crew who, who was on the deck, you know, on the control deck there. And he volunteered to, um, he had a different name, Lieutenant something, you know, you know, officer in the Federation, right? So he volunteered to somehow merge with the V'ger. You know, he would 
could combine with her and give himself to her, but she wouldn't have to devour him. And somehow through kind of love, he would love Vijar. And then Vijar would know what it was to be human because she'd be beloved or something. I mean, she was assumed she because it had a voice, female voice. And and then they, as he's then he goes, and then he he sort of walks over to the machine or something. I forget how they did it visually, but he disappears anyway. <laughs> and then the whole machine disappears. Yeah, I mean, either. the entire thing. And there's this wave of light going everywhere in the universe. And there's a kind of a goodbye sort of thing. Oh, it's so I'm so happy. And, and so it was the meeting of a loving, self-sacrificing, you know, altruistic human, a handsome guy, the actor, my old uh, restaurant mate, uh, Frank Converse. And I don't know where he is. I never saw him again after that. But and and a sort of supercomputer, which turned out to be Voyager, and the O Y A had been lost, you know. And then it oh, the that's out. right. It was Voyager returning with all this power, you know. And, and, and then, but then it was solved by the supercomputer meeting a kind of simple-minded male who was, uh, however, uh, human consciousness. It, it sounds a little and brave. You know, and then the, somehow that union was uh, the, what you know, in tantric form of enlightenment, you call the Buddhahood a communion, the union of a pair of beings that are completely empathetically merged with each other, and yet each one enjoying that, that that loving orgasmic merger. Well, orgasmic as well. I want to get into that too, because Bob, it sounds like a little like you're describing what people are, are now saying is occurring with AI. And human consciousness. Do you, yeah, do you reflect so. on that? Is that what's actually there's it's something not, to that, isn't well, there? But, well, but FI, you know, FI, female intelligence. You know, yes, and and uh, you know the inte intelligence of, that is realistic and empathetic, and unbordered, and able to open its border and embrace everything. You know, and then and then uh, and, and that dealing with sort of the human that feels like alienated and like I'm not the whole universe. And so I'm scared of it because what it might do to me, or what there might be a tiger out there, or whatever, a tick, or a, 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 a microbe that's going to eat me. And it came from a, a bat cave in China. <laughs> so that's going to make me really sick. And so, so the, the idea of I'm different from everything else, and somehow I'm only able to, I only have the energy of whatever I can do in regard to everything else. So I'm at war in a way, ultimately, with the universe, which is the egotistical person's hopeless situation which to realize it is a friendly fun fact because when you realize that you realize that the way of dealing with the universe is to be the universe we are the universe right and, and, and i guess you I realize can, that it's one of the fun you, facts is to realize that isn't it right and you can experience it up to a point and even in order to survive like a living being you have to procreate and that way you have to merge with others you know first partner and then children and so on, and there's a kind of merger there to some degree, and then you have to merge with a nation, you know, and like Obama scolding people in the during the Gore election about how, you know, the libertarian thinks they did everything because they're a billionaire, but actually they had to drive on the roads and they had to talk to the people and they had to pick up the phone and whatever it was, you know, and there's a lot of infrastructure that they depend on that they get from others, so they should pay it back a little bit, you know, and they'll still be super prosperous and happy and interconnected. So, I mean, that's a, so, so that's what the 99% of the 1% you have intrigued me with that question. And so the 99% is that you've had moments of expanding your boundaries and it was really good. And it was for, you know, within a certain, within a certain limit, you felt extremely secure and okay, and you could manage. And you even were feeling so good that little problem went wrong with something and you stubbed your toe or something and you didn't mind that much it was a little painful but you overrode the pain with the orgasmic bliss and we've experienced that so you know that there's a way of even developing such a powerful internal feeling it can expand and overwhelm some external irritants and then if you, so you can whatever percentage of that you've ever experienced when you revise your analysis of your own experience and you really become more introspectively aware of yourself then that gives you confidence that they're given that you have infinite time in that the idea of an ultimate limit to the universe is asinine 
because what a limit means is a boundary, yes, but the boundary always has to have something on the other side that's not within the boundary. There's something outside the boundary, right? So then technically the idea that there's some ultimate boundary with a nothing outside, but then nothing is not is not something, so it can't be anything. So that's not a boundary. And so it has a... to be something, so it's not a boundary, so it continues, so there is no end. Exactly. So and that goes for time as well. And so, and awareness is part of it. So, therefore, awareness is potentially infinite, and it in, in time and space. Although there are obviously embodiments that are not, and so, therefore, under that reasoning, that one percent may still be like huge and infinite. But since there's infinite time to ex expand into it, then sooner or later, we want to try to contract away from it. But since there, the idea of a black hole of going into nothing is irrational. Because nothing is not there, and therefore an infinite bunch of somethings can never fit into nothing because nothing's not a space for them to fit That's in. That's right. And so following that logic, it must be then. So you say it's still 1%, but it, it must not be 1%. It must be. Well, the percentage number, again, is is based on the idea of some infinite, limited space. You know, you just arbitrarily define space. So therefore, infinity is not one. Infinity is infinite infinities, you know. And so that gives you confidence that you are there already. And also we're all infinite now because if infinity was excluded from our boundary, our skin or something, and there was an interior that was not, not occupied by infinity, it wouldn't be infinity. So we're simultaneously infinite, but we just, we only are focused on the finitude. And so then we have this problem of worrying about what out, what's out there and might do to, what it might do to us. That's right. What? We spend perhaps the time there that we should not. We should spend it on the spot that's out there, as you describe. A, a little bit of what you're saying reminds me of some of the things I've heard of people that have described uh, a near-death experience, right? As they've gone into the light, right? Where they see it and they Absolutely. realize, right? What we're describing Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Like, uh, I oh, I met at the Milken Institute of all places, a big conference in LA just now. I met a woman who was on my panel very sort of very sweet and and elegant Indian 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 you know woman who but who grew up in Hong Kong Mur Anita Murjani was her, is her name who wrote a book like Dying to Be Me the title of the book which I have an ebook now but I have only got started on it uh, because she told her story in the panel you know in her in her fifteen minutes and we had, we had four of us and uh, it was amazing because she was. In a hospital in Hong Kong, she was in a coma, and she was riddled with tumors. And the family and the doctors in this Western-style fancy hospital in you know elegant Hong Kong, before it was crushed by the idiot communist, she she uh, was aware of the whole situation from out-of-body awareness. People talking, she knew the names of people. Who she hadn't met when she was before the coma, and they were all amazed later, and all this. But and they were talking about whether to pull the plug, because she was being intubulated, or whatever you call it, and she, they were keeping pumping her lungs, etc. So and the brain was flat, and they were saying, and there was they argue not argument because they weren't arguing, but I mean the the discussion, the, yeah, the, the discussion occurring right as she's intubated about wow. whether the brain was already vegetative, and she couldn't even if she sort of recovered some sort of mobility. Uh, she would be a vegetable and it would be called no quality of life and blah, blah, blah. And she was aware of all of that in, this, in space, kind of what, well, what we Buddhists would call, Buddhist scientists would call, not Buddhist religious, Buddhist scientists would call clear light, transparency. And so she was she was sort of empathetic with everybody in the room. She was still aware that there, there was some connection to her body, although it was in a coma. And she was sort of thinking it over and say or something. Say, I have to read the book to give more detail. Yes. So fully. So she then realized that she was capable. The reason she was riddled with cancer is she would, she did therapies and things that were ineffective because people said she should and that it was wrong. And she would she knew the path to how to cure herself. And that if she really was took over and really lived freely and did what she felt like doing, she would be fine. She could be quickly cured. She realized that. And also that everybody's sort of different 
internal agonies she could feel, family losing her. She was a really nice person. And, you know, they would be distressed and they were distressed about it. And even the ones who didn't like her might be believed she was gone, but then they'd feel guilty. I mean, she completely knew everything. And then, so she decided, I'm going to go back to heal myself and I'm going to change the situation. And she did. And she sat up and she said, no, I don't want any more of this medicine. And that. <laughs> Enough of that. And then some doctor ran down the hallway who she had never seen her when she was conscious. And she said, oh, Mr. Coleman, don't throw away my chart. I said, I, said, I love that this is documented. I said, Keep it. She says, how did you know my name? Well, they, did they mention me? And then she says, I, of course I know your name. You were worrying down the hall. And she had this higher, you know, broader consciousness. And then she, in three weeks, she was completely spontaneous remission, a miracle. They were like, they couldn't understand it. And she, and she wrote this book and she's been talking about it ever since to people, but she's not making, getting rich and famous. She was already a wealthy family. She was not getting any big And change. that's not the reason she's doing it. It's because she had that experience and she has now something to share, right? And it's important that her message is heard. Thank you for sharing that. Exactly. And she loved people, you know? And I was so, because I could see her because, because I think other people couldn't because materialist cultural people think that it that's impossible. You can't have miracles. There's no fund of energy that someone would get and, and a mind outside the brain that isn't in, that, what's in, that's in a coma, that they would be able to use that to as agency to re-enter the body and heal itself. And it was, that's impossible because there is no mind. Because we we're educated to think that it's just an epiphenomenon of the brain and it's a delusion. And it's, it doesn't exist. And the chef proving that it does exist, actually. The mind is some... It's a kind of, it's like an impossible force and something's wrong with our categories. But, and, and, and actually the Buddhist description of transparency and clear light, Buddhist science description of that, which fits with some mystical descriptions from other cultures. But that description, it doesn't claim that that's a final explanation because that is not explicable in binary linguistic in term. our language right we don't have the words to explain it. why do we need to explain it i guess right. i i guess we right. try to explain it, but it doesn't need to be explained it is just like you can't if you're even you're the greatest poet that ever lived you cannot describe the blissful experience of eating a really delicious apple when you're hungry that's right the language isn't there to capture the full essence of it juiciness this that, that you know this texture of it. You can do a lot of stuff and you can tie the to analyze the chemistry and you can talk about the neurons and taste and blah, blah. But you never can really capture the experience that we just do experience beyond words. And that's the importance yeah. of joy, Bob. As we talk joy or living in joy, right? To have that and experience that as frequently as we can because like that Mac amplifies, Mac doesn't Mac it? McAvoy with no vowel between the M and the C. That's right. That's, an, that's, that's a mystery. Why is it McAvoy? It's why is it McAvoy? McAvoy. That's right. You can't say Mka. Mka. Even the M We've we come to learn, right? It's been understood to be that way have, here. You have to have Mka. Mka. McAvoy. <laughs> and we say McAvoy. And where does it come from? It's not written there. <laughs> That's right. It's been passed to us. It has been passed to us, which was part of that miracle. And you speak of miracles. I want to speak of one that you've. I've heard you describe. Uh, because like her experience, Bob, you learned to speak Tibetan in, in some 10 weeks. Like that in itself is a miracle. Can you describe what that experience was like? You know, the really horrible thing about it was I was immediately so annoying. <laughs> Insufferable, I'm sure. My teacher was a Mongolian guy, and he had brought four Tibetans, but the Dalai Lama had sent. They were all monks. But the young ones soon weren't, but they were monks at that point. And they were trying to learn English, and he was looking for English teachers to teach them. And then, and the exchange was he would teach me Tibetan because he, he rejected my quest for enlightenment because he said I was too crazy. But if I learned the language and studied, then I might get there. He was sort of like that. Uh, but then, and then we could therefore only make a kind of exchange said some big guru disciple would freak out, although that's what I wanted because I felt this huge huge field around him I sort of sensed about you know, I tasted you know the, the the a in the McAvoy and and um, I didn't know what it was but it was something I had to be with him and but he just learned the language so then it just came I loved that language it was so fantastic and uh, 
And then I was immediately wanting to debate with the Tibetans instead of teaching them English. And then they, one of them was a little bit older and he was a scholar, you know. And I was debating him ferociously about that's wrong and it's about the fourth truth. And, On what topic or any topic? Annoying. You, were just, was so you just wanted to debate. I was annoying. Well, that you know, because the study in the Buddhist thing is analysis. And debating with others makes you revise your own ideas. You start to investigate yourself and you have internal debate, you know, and you pump up the internal debate by learning to argue in a reasonable way, not just a yes, no, yes, no, you know, I am I can say yes louder than you say no, or I can say no louder than you say yes. not that kind of debate, but a debate where you have to give reasons and, you know, you do that. And so I was very annoying, <laughs> really, pain in my Mongolian guy. He refused to teach me the rules of debate in Tibetan. I said, why don't you teach me that? That's part of the thing. He said, because you'll bother so many people. <laughs> You can debate them without knowing the rules, just you go right ahead. But to leave these poor people alone, teach them English. <laughs> can you say some of that? Can you describe some of the rules for debate in Tibetan to us? Well, yeah. Well, you know, you go to the four answers, you know, when they give you an argument with a premise and a, the and a, a, a thesis and a reason and an example. In Indian logic and Tibetan logic, Hindu and Buddhist both, you have to you, you have to give an example. Like, you know, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. So in a way, Socrates is the example. But but Socrates is not doesn't count as the example in Indian logic because Socrates is the one you're talking about. So he's part of the thesis, the actual person. So you have to give, like uh, Aristotle, you know, you have to give another person who's a man and who's mortal, you know, or someone who died already. So and then and then a counterexample of the rock is not a man, so they they're not mortal. So, in other words, uh, it sort of has to stay pragmatic, because like Greek syllogism doesn't have logical syllogism doesn't have to have a pragmatic example from reality, common sense reality around you. Whereas the Indian one, and the, which is from then the Tibetans learned that and refined it, and that's that has to be has to remain pragmatic. So there are so rules when someone makes the makes their argument, their syllogism, you know, their they give their thesis about the topic. They pick the topic. They give a thesis about it. They give the reason, the evidence for that, the reason for that. And then they give the example and another case where that evidence goes with that uh, thesis. And and then a counterexample where it doesn't, where there, there, there's no evidence for the thesis. So those the, that's the argument. So you say, accept, or you say, why? Or you say, it doesn't, it's not concomitant, doesn't follow. I think three, and then there's another one which I forgot because they never properly taught me. And so, because because you would just go on and Avamajung, De, Chichir, those three. But there's one, the fourth one, which I'm not remembering right. I think it's uh, you know, do it again or something like that. Chichir means give a further um, uh, reason, further evidence. De means I accept it, I like it. Uh, and Kaba uh, Majung means it doesn't follow. Your reason doesn't follow. So it's a little different than the GTR means just well, is a more broad why. Those are the three main ones, but there is one other one that's like. I, I, and, and, I mean, Bob, it strikes me as though you refuse to be bound to even that, right? As you're learning, uh, and in a, it must be a miracle to have learned that and think of where your learning of the language has taken you, right? Uh, we discussed, I guess, offline 62 years ago, right? 1962. Yes. I guess you decided to, to traipse off, right? To uh, uh, shun all things. Uh, American, uh, you go well, to no, find I your know. quest as a young man and come no, back no, with this knowledge. Since, since, since then, I know who I was, and I was a Tibetan in a previous life. I know that. I didn't know that then, but now I do. So clearly, I was doing that. And there are other proofs, you know. The main the main proof that really began to convince me after a year or two, about it actually took a long time, because the strong conditioning of our consensus thing Oh yeah, former future life. Sure, everybody was Caesar or Cleopatra or something, and they're going to be whatever. But but somehow viscerally, you don't really feel that. It's like you know, you won't do something that you know will be a problem for you in a week, you know. But you don't really think in the next life, I don't want to do something that be a problem for the next life. It doesn't really. It is not on our map. You know what I mean? But what happened that really became convincing to me was when I went to Dharamsala which was about two years after that first language learning, or almost two years, I ate zampa. And zampa is roasted barley flour 
and you, uh, which is already kind of cooked, it's, but it's a powder, but it's already been cooked. And then you put some hot buttered tea in a little bowl of that powder and you make little balls moisten it by moistening it. And then you eat that. That's it for breakfast, you know. And that's a, that's a, their national, uh, like, you know, like it's like bread or something. Because they don't have, in the high altitude, you can't bake. And you you know you take your hair around this powder you know but you you've roasted it though on a fire, so when I tasted that I tasted Cheerios. Wow! And when I was a kid I refused Rice Krispies and Corn Flakes and I wouldn't eat them. Don't give me those. I was a real brat. And but Cheerios I have to have Cheerios, and that's all all I would eat was Cheerios, and I tasted Cheerios in the Tibetan zampa. And so then, oh, okay, I definitely had lives as a Tibetan. You realize you were Homer had eaten that before, right? <laughs> Even though it's barley flour mostly, not oats. Cheerios are oats, right? But uh, but Zamba is barley flour. But still, something about the roasting and something, it was totally the taste of Cheerios. And I love <laughs> it. You know what I found out only recently? Do you know who KD is, Krishna Das? I do not, no. So you don't you don't link up with the Ramdas sort of group. He's you know the, the you know the Indian Al side. The, no, not no. I'm not. I'm, I mean, I've heard what you're describing. I've heard reference to, but yes, I'm not that Krishna familiar. Krishna Das is a is a great bhakti singer. You know, he was a rock and roll singer, but then he he hi Krishna, Krishna Krishna. You know, he's world famous and very popular by Indians in India too. Although he's from Brooklyn, usual <laughs> guy from Brooklyn. But anyway, I found out that when we did a summer school together a year or two ago, he had, goes around with a big bag of Cheerios when he's on tour. And I had him brought Cheerios. I, I'm no longer a complete Cheerio, Cheerio, Cheerio fanatic, but anyway, he shared his Cheerios with me. I was, <laughs> but then he's not, he doesn't know him whether he, he likes the Tibetan thing, actually, although it's, he's Indian-oriented. It's but interesting. The Tibetans do love, to them, India is the Holy Land, help to understand. Yeah, so well, they, it's it's interesting. Interesting. Tibet is a wonderful, wonderful chosen high mountain place. They like living at altitude because they're adapted to it. But it's very difficult to be adapted to 10, 12,000 feet from birth and from placenta. That's why they know Tibet was not well colonized. And the Chinese attempt to colonize it now will fail because women cannot produce the right amount of placenta. Women who are not acclimatized to that from the 47% of oxygen that you have at 12,000 feet. You know, you don't have, you don't have 100% of sea level oxygen. And so the, they, they, when, uh, when Chinese officials' wives become pregnant, when they're stationed in Tibet, they send them down to sea level or, you know, 1,000 feet or 500 feet down to uh, the mainland, the lowland China, or they send them down there to form their baby, you know, because otherwise they can't, you know, only somehow Tibetans manage it. How did you manage when you were there? When you were there originally, did you did you find that you had some issues acclimatizing yourself? Oh uh, no, no. Well, I did, I mostly was with them in the around seven thousand, eight thousand in the foothills of the Himalayas where I lived with them because they were already invaded by the time I they just Dalai Lama had just escaped three years before, uh, four years before I met him, and um, uh, you know the, the so and then I only visited Tibet in the eighties. I started visiting Tibet in the eighties. So I had 20 years of going there every year, sometimes several times I was so thrilled to go there. Although less and less thrilled as the more and more settlers came into the cities, but the land itself and the, the holy places and things that are and like Mount Kailash and the, the sort of sacred spots are amazing. You know? I mean, Tibet is amazing. And, you know, and he taught world. you a great deal, but, but I think he wanted to learn from you as well, didn't he? The, who, who? The Dalai Lama. I mean, you became good buddies. You uh, still we, are yeah, to this we day. Became so. Friends. So I, don't, I wasn't officially a tutor of his, but in a way I was. In our first period together, when I was studying to be a monk for a couple of years there, I, because he kind of downloaded, you know, whatever I'd learned at St. Bernard's Exeter in Harvard, and I had to make up words for, you know, uh, you know, but I wasn't, he was a little frustrated with me because I wasn't a chemistry major or a physics major. These are the things he wanted to know? He was a literary type, you know. Right. And so, but I, I managed to pull together like a little, like plutonium radiation and how you make an A-bomb, you know. I could manage a little bit. I had to make up words in Tibetan thing. Since then, and he he's had a life had had a lifelong dialogue with lots of scientists since then. 
you know. But I was just a conversation partner with him. I wasn't really a tutor of his because I was so much into learning myself. But then he didn't really get answer my questions in that first round because he was still studying. He was in, still in his 22 and uh, six years more than me. But then he would re refer me to sort of serious philosophical or dharma or meditation questions to the senior, his own teachers, you know. So we're kind of, we had a little, we have a little bit in our relationship like co-students, you know, still almost. We do so he like that's why he kind of likes me because I'm I'm not quite as deferential to him as the other people. Well, you're I, a buddy. You're a buddy. You guys can have conversations about things. Ceremonial context, or you know, I am, and also he really has been a teacher of mine since the late seventies and early eighties, and and especially in the esoteric stuff, he really has taught a lot, and I consider him my my guru. Uh, but he but 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 one of the nat one of his his elements as that is he has what I call resilience of identity in that he's kind of an official guru in a, in a ceremony, initiatory or something, you know, like blah, blah, learning a mantra, and then when you're hanging out and having a cup of tea, he's cracking jokes and laughing and you're being normal, you know, he's not, you don't have to fall on his feet all the time or act like, oh, oh what, 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 you know, you don't have to act like that. And actually he doesn't like sanctimoniousness and formalities as he calls it and i don't either and so isn't that yeah, what he's teaching well, as well and what you're teaching is that i mean it's to be human as well he's not looking for that pomp yes, and ceremony at all times with the, what he's teaching is the point he's not just conferring some gimmick that you when you get it then you're going to be saved because you can't do that even they call on tara to help you out of a jam she can't make you enlighten they are you know the teacher is like more like a coach you know, a football coach, he foot he coaches you, make this play and run through there and then catch that pass. But then you have to go do it to get, make the touchdown. He can't make the touchdown for you. So the the in that sense, Buddhism is not a religion. I mean, in in its essence, because he's not saying that if you just repeat this or say or believe that, you're going to be saved because so and so will save you. He's saying so and so can't save you, or he would have. But he can explain to you how you can find out that you have the ability to save yourself as a human being by understanding this and that, you know, and by doing and by living ethically and being kind and doing this and that in relation to the people you're interconnected with and the beings that you're interconnected, not just people, beings that you're interconnected with. So, so, so that's a, so that makes it more like an educational institution. And I'm so proud of His Holiness. Just now, He's he's sort of pulling together his legacy at the age of 90, although he has promised to live still longer. But to his own people, he has promised them because he did still straighten out the situation. The Chinese you know, overlords, the occupants, you know, the colonial occupants of Tibet. And uh, so he may have to live a long time for that, but uh, it's good that he's no, still no, on no, the path. It'll, it'll work. Don't worry. Don't worry. It'll work. All these kind of Ukrainian invasions, Uyghur enslavements, Mongolian uh, domination. It's all similar, right? It's the same pattern being repeated here. I call here. them ethnocides. They are, they are colonial things and they become ethnocides because then they feel they have to change their culture to be the colonial culture or they be someday they might break away. You know, they like that. And especially if they've told the rest of the world that they always were Chinese, you know, and they're just a variety. As they rewrite things or try to have it come to be, it's right? Which we know is not the case. You have to make them feel they are Chinese. And, uh, or 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 leave, you know. So so that but that doesn't work, you know. It's like you know, Iowans are not going to be New Yorkers, you know. The human beings, uh, and yet Iowans are happy to make a good contribution as Iowans, as long as they're allowed to be Iowans, and they'll contribute to a federational type of situation, sure. And the world should be one giant federation, right? Where well, we, it is. It's just yeah, we, it we is, get in the is. way, right? And we get leaders yeah, that get in the way one, of that. One one people want to like oppress others to sort of get an edge against the others, sort of robber baron thing. The problem is there is no king of the world. And so and so everybody has to be king. Democracy is so chaotic. And then you get robber barons and they're messing things up, you know, because they yeah, want to fight. Like, why, why bother to fight when we can share? And there's plenty of empty land everywhere. And, um, and no problem. You know? Not everyone is as evolved. Not everyone has uh, seen the light yet. Uh, but we are one. We are we are I going there. Seeing, I'm very optimistic. I think that we are seeing it. 
like, you know, the, everybody refers to history, well, it's always been like this and that. And meanwhile, in history, until recently, like 90% of people were uneducated. They were just, they were illiterate. And they just did farm work for somebody who manipulated them because they were keeping records and then how many bushels of wheat and rice, you know. And then the other ones just producing it and they were and when things were good, they were getting enough to live on themselves. And then they maybe their children could live a little better and have a little more farmland. So it was it was, it was a sense of improvement about the future. And uh, and that worked. But now everybody's educated. And everybody's on Facebook and everybody has JP's podcast. And you know, the millionaire lawyer. And so everybody sees what everybody's doing. Like I just one of the one of the things I read this now to be six minutes late. There was an article about yachts in the London Review of Books, reviewing some book about these insane yachts. 350 meter long yacht belonging to the Aga Khan, more than Russian oligarch. 300, that's three and a half football field. <laughs> yeah. More than field. There's a meters lower than a yard. So, a little bit. So, it's insane. And then they do it to get away, right? But then when you have such a huge thing, you have this enormous staff. And then the staff don't have pensions. They don't have benefits. They're not, they're not, they're living, they're kind of, you have a, I didn't know that there are agencies that give you temporary, you like outsource the people in the engine room, the cooks, to this, to that. And the captain maybe has benefits and he's your friend. But otherwise, they're not at all your friends, you know. And so actually you haven't gotten away at all and you're still depending on them not poisoning you and not <laughs> like taking over your yacht and getting pissed off. So you haven't gotten away from anything. You're dragging the insecurity of having more than the other people, or really a lot more. You're dragging it with you out there on the ocean. And the weight of that is all following you around, isn't it? Hundreds of people who are like slaving away to give you your 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 creme or chocolate creme de menthe or whatever you have, mousse de chocolat, they could throw you overboard in the Atlantic any time. So you the 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 this the paranoia that made you want to leave downtown New York or leave downtown LA or leave whatever it was is still following you. So then naturally the extreme one like Elon wants to go to Mars. And he wants robots to take care of him so that he, he won't have to think about anybody being mad at him. <laughs> and it 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 begs the question, and I guess you wrote on this, right? And the wisdom is bliss. Like, what is what is real? Like what what are we trying to what are we trying to do here? We're trying to be in love, obviously, and be loved and love. And actually, we've noticed. That when we, even if we're loved and we don't love, it doesn't help. Temporarily, it's kind of yeah, good and we can exploit it. But it doesn't really get it, push us over the brink. Only when we can kind of leave ourselves, you know, like transcend our like evaluation of how good is it, you know, which is what you have to give yourself up, right? You have to die. Oh, I would die to experience that again. You know, I mean, you have to kind of really let go of it all. And then, then, and that's love. So what we what we're here for is to love ourselves and others, and 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 if others reciprocate, that's great. And if we really realize that when we feel like like Gene Kelly, remember, dancing in the rain, singing in the rain, or whatever it was, you know, dancing around, it's raining, doesn't bother with the umbrella. The rain is annoying, but he doesn't care because he's in love. And that and 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 everyone loves that movie, you know. Even today, you see it black and white on PBS. It's just a, it's a, it's a gas because you want to keep your your beloveds happy, and you need to feed your and you like yourself, so you want to keep yourself happy, and so you need wealth and you try for that, and then it's nice to have a little more maybe, but there is a sufficiency point of a little more and a little less, and then if you, you want the people you're around you to not feel much less, so you feel safe with them. They're not too jealous of you, and you don't want to be too jealous of anybody else. So it's a, there's a kind of a range. You can move around up and down in a range, and that's the best. That's the best, and it's a very it's complicated. You know, capitalism is is that that capitalism is very important. Buddhism, kind of ancient Buddhist ethics, likes capitalism, 
And people like to make more wealth. And one of the great things you can do with more wealth is give it away, like the Rockefeller Foundation or the, you know, the the Ford Foundation, you know, and that they sort of happen. And then we're cynical and we say, well, reluctantly, they don't really want it, but they just finally, what else? They, they can't do? take it with them. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but in a way, they don't. They 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 like to start giving things away. You know, they do. And that is, of course, the great. It's like at Christmas or Hanukkah or what or Kwanzaa or whatever it is. The the only one who really has fun is the little kid, and the and the parents, they keep the 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 tags, the price tags on the presents, so that someone can exchange them in case they don't like them. <laughs> oh, the little kid doesn't get it; it's all ripped to ripped the back, the package off, and oh, I got a present. <laughs> That's all. They're so happy, and then that happiness is the main happiness of those holidays. The other one, the other one is like, well, I really wish you'd gotten me a BMW and not a Lexus. You know, like, I'm gonna take it back. You know, I want to switch it. You know, it's like, uh, and so we grow out of that joy yeah, that we feel we as a as a young one, don't we? And we search for that the rest of our lives. Uh, exactly. It's so important to be so in that place. Giving, you know, and and then if you if you talk about sex therapy, where does orgasm really come from? Where it's sort of a point where you're sort of giving yourself as well as getting something, but where is it coming from? It actually is coming from within yourself of letting go. Actually, the really powerful stuff. Yeah, you know, the orgasm, and, and you describe it as the Buddhism as well, right? I mean, to right? take it in the philosophical sense, you describe it as the Buddhism as well. Yes, exactly. And that's a beautiful thing about Indian and Tibetan Buddhism, uh, Tantra, you know, where they represent a Buddha as a male-female in a union, you know, in a balanced union, you know where inner and outer and other and self are transcended and so forth and in a loving connection. And, you know, I remember once I was doing a course when I was a young professor at Amherst College. And there was a course that, was, that we used to do that we would join the other colleague from a different field, freshman seminar type of thing. And I had this guy who was American historian. And there was a lady who was a theologian, but a feminist theologian, and then me. And we were doing different things from the, the, our own field. And at one point, there was a slide on the thing. I was just talking about Tibetan Tantra of a male-female union. And he'd been talking about the, the great awakening of the male god, you know, in the Protestant thing in the 1830s. So forth. He was, that was his field. And he was talking about that with the students. And she was talking about God the mother and how it's trying to break through and get rid of patriarchal imagery and religion and see the ultimate reality as a mother and some other cultures and so forth. And then when my turn came, I said, well, here's God. Here's the ultimate, it's not quite God, not the creator, but it's sort of the ultimate. It's a Buddha, but it's a both are the Buddha, the male and the female are both Buddha and they're in union. And he freaked out, he was very into psychology, the guy, I think he had a therapist. And he says, his other name was also Bob. And he says, what can culture be? Bob, a culture where the ultimate is represented as the primal scene. <laughs> that is Victorian psychology, the primal scene. When little Rosemary walks in and mom and dad are getting it on, you know, or little Joe, and then they get all neurotic about it, you know, because their Oedipal or electric complexes get activated subliminally in Freudian thing. So he goes, so God has the primal scene. And I didn't know what to say, but it came blurted out of my mouth. Well, Bob, I said, how about a grown-up culture? <laughs> yeah, how about a grown-up? I love how you describe sort of Western science, Western philosophy as being sort of in, in kindergarten, right? So it it's time to grow up. I didn't know what to say, kind of, but so it was a desperate ploy. But I just said, "How about a grown-up culture? You know, where you're not hiding stuff from kids, you know, and uh, and uh, everybody's aware of everything, you know." I'm struck as you talk. I mean, thank you for this, Bob. As we get to a, a few more questions here, just to wrap things up. Uh, uh, as um, I talk with elders, you know, I've just, just attended a, a powwow and you speak with elders or, or any spiritual leader, I'm fascinated by the intersection of the religions, right? Of the philosophies, yeah. right? And going back to, to, to Buddhism and like being kind, being good, like these are things that, the, that our teachers are trying to teach us, right? It's that intersection of things. It's so important for us to hear, isn't it? Well, his, the Dalai Lama is really great and the interreligious thing, which he's very into, and, and even at a, in a radical way, actually, where he wants to get over whatever there is in Buddhism about we're the best one. He thinks they all should quit that 
and he, and and they should decide they have to find that if they think I knew I used to know a wonderful uh, Mort, Dean Morton at the St. John in New York who was Christian but he used to say if God is absolute he can have as many religions as he wants that's right of course he himself was an Episcopalian right but 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 he said so therefore we have to stop the idea that everybody has to be converted to ours or they're doomed or, and they're lesser beings than us so religion can be used as a way of doing genocides on people or killing or yeah, war. Yeah, I think they're killing each other over over a religion, right? It's the opposite of what the teachings are. Exactly. And so, and so, I think that's very true today. And and um, and Dalai Lama feels, for example, that secular humanism is by having anthropological studies and noticing that human beings, the young, are helpless for decades. And they need kindness of strangers who, who initially are there. You know, when a baby is first born, your own baby, well, it's your name and have a birth certificate, but you've never seen that guy before. <laughs> you don't know who that is. So you're a stranger in a way. You get to feel familiar, but at first you're a stranger and you have to be kind to it or it's doomed, you know, it's finished. So because of that, the kindness is already there in secular humanism. That's a spirituality and secularism, in other words. So he always wants an interreligious thing. He wants the secularist, the materialist, to be brought in. He's much nicer than me, who I'm always criticizing him. But he is, I'm, a, I'm not really criticizing him in a bad way, but I just want them to be more open and less dogmatic. I, I'm with that about everybody. But, but anyway, that's really important. So that we see that kindness is like a natural thing. And any religion that has lasted, it isn't some temporary cult where the people eventually rebel and they hate being oppressed, you know, but is a, is a, has lasted for thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. It has to be, kindness has to be the core of it, you know, because domination, conquest, oppression, cruelty, is, nobody wants it. <laughs> nobody likes it. No animals like it. No humans like it. And the predator doesn't even like it, and therefore they don't attack you when they're not hungry. You know, they're kind of forced to do it in a way by their appetite. They, mm -hmm. they, they can't control them. So, so, uh, so I think that's really important. Finally, you know, and and um, and I know I was looking at um, the Book of Revelation recently for a friend who was worried about this misuse of Christianity in our country at the moment to condone violence and condone domination and control, you know, destroy all the immigrants or hate everybody who's of a different race or whatever, or somebody who has different sexual orientation. And sort of Jesus is, wants you to do that. And they were asking me for to, is that what resources in Christianity can be used to calm those people down, you know? And, uh, uh, you know, they want the U.S., they say they claim there never was a separation of church and state and we don't, have, you know, we don't have religious freedom here. We should, we're really a Christian country and everybody has to follow our view. And and then I happened to look at that because I, I knew there was something in the book of Revelation. And there is a great thing there. Although the rapture and the final Armageddon, the whole thing is all very violent and terrible. At the end, in the New Jerusalem, there's no temple. And they say the, the John of Patmos, that Greek guy, said in his, in his, or channels in his thinking that angel was talking to him or whatever. He says the reason there's no temple there is that God and Jesus is all in all, and that is people are living like Jesus. In other words, that is to say, they are turning, they're giving you their coat when they ask for their shirt. They're being kind. They're being friendly. They're being joyful, whatever, you know, like the the lilies in the field, you know, that sort of nice mystical side of the what what the rabbi Jesus said, you know. Nice Jewish rabbi Jesus. <laughs> and and so it 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 so is all of the that hostility coming out of religion and in his name is he really doesn't like. And he says that. Actually, I know the other one I know that I told my friend who 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 runs a political thing. You know, and he wants to, you know, he's in the battle and that we're all in. Uh, he, uh, in, in Matthew, after he's given the Sermon on the Mount, you know, of the Beatitudes, as they're called, right? Be loving, which is every good rabbi talks like that. Love everybody, you know. And uh, uh, after doing that, he then says, oh, when later, sort of as, a, as an epilogue, he says, you know, later when I'm at the right hand of the Father, and when some guy comes to me and says, Lord, Lord, I did great deeds of power in your name. 
I will say, get thee gone, ye evildoer, I know ye not. I mean, in the English translation, right? So in other words, he doesn't want his name used for deeds of power, of domination and oppression and cruelty and violence and so forth. He doesn't want that. He wants them to live his beatitudes, in other words. And, and, uh, and so there are, there are plenty of grounds within all the world religions to prevent people from using religion as an excuse to do violence on other beings. Really. Well said, and a teaching for all of us from there, no, uh, Bob. So, so that that's the faith that we all should cultivate, I think, you know. And I think it comes from, you know, I I do consider that we are all terrorized by different authoritarian cultures, to feel that that reality is unsafe, and reality is dangerous, and so we need them to protect us from that dangerous reality. And whether they well, that's that, what they want you to believe, though. That's yeah, what they're yeah. That's exactly. that's what allows them to maintain power for a certain period of time. But as you just said before, that always fails in the end as well. Exactly, exactly. I mean, uh, people who think that, you know, the theory that was started from Singapore, which is very wrong on the planet right now, started by the dictators of Singapore from the Lee family, uh, uh, the Lee Kuan Yew, and he started it, and then there's later Lees have been the dictators there in Singapore. It's just changing finally. But... Uh, that theory, which is that Chinese people like to be bossed around and they and democracy is a Western invention and it's an imposition and it's cultural colonialistic and blah, 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 is completely wrong, actually. And it's false. And Chinese are human. And they that wonderful movie, The Crazy Rich People in Singapore, even though <laughs> that's so fun, that movie. I love that movie. It's a fun movie, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And it shows that they are like to, you know, they are wild and woolly themselves, and they love to have fun. They want and, their they want their moment dancing in the rain as well, right? And uh, exactly. that's what that teaches us. I think wants, we all do that. We all want everybody that. wants to be free. Actually, libertarians yeah. are precisely want to be free, and so libertarians, unfortunately, libertarians are created have created democracy. They were libertarians, Jefferson and Franklin. Of course, they were white and they were this and that landowners. But they they wanted to be free from the the idiot English king from the weight of that yacht as well. They didn't want to be carrying that around with them, and they tried okay. to shed that right the, the, the experiment. And we're we're and almost there. There's elements of that we got yeah, right as well. This, and this is where Democrats, I think, have to learn. And I think Joe Biden a little bit has it with his sunglasses and his thing, which is that democracy is more fun. That's what the chaos is more fun. Donald Lemma thinks that. He tells the story of going to with Mao to the parliament in China. Nobody, there's dead silence. Anybody just looking to see what the boss wanted them to say, then they would say something, but otherwise dead silence. No and fun. Taken by Nehru to the Indian parliament, and everybody was screaming, and they were practically having fights, and they were running around, and it was chaotic. And he was so happy. He felt it somehow his instinct was that was better. <laughs> that sounds like a lot more fun. That's the type of fun uh, I want. Bob, I've had a lot of fun here today. Uh, I want to just end on a couple things and then uh, and then we'll say yes. Yes. Uh, we'll say until right. next time. Um, um, you you spoke of the Dalai Lama's legacy, right? He's still got some time and some things he's 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 got to do. I've heard you say that you plan to live to 104, which is interesting because my father always says the same thing. He's about your age, and he always says he's going to live to 104 as well. I plan to do at least that myself. So you've right. got some time here. Your next cycle. Like what? What are some of the things that you want to do accomplished in the next in the next cycle? In the next, yeah, I'm eighty. I'm going to be eighty three in a few weeks, in a few months, in a month or so. And um, I I was ordered by him, and I would like to fulfill that to live as long as he does, at least. So that would be for my case, hundred and four. His case, he's promised one hundred and ten. He originally had a prophecy he could do one hundred and twenty, but he claimed, "Oh, I can't spend so stressed or so on." And he's just saying that. And then it was 113, and now it's 110. And um, and uh, he uh, he likes Western medicine and Tibetan medicine both. Tibetan medicine for long-term maintenance and Western medicine for some problem, you know, some emergency problems. He loves that. And um, and he's uh, he he tries to get the best of both worlds through some principles that they have in Tibetan medical theory that is very, very Buddhist medical theory that's very, very good. And um, Ayurveda, it's like Ayurveda in India. And uh, it should, should be legal, like in India, all three or four medical systems are legal and they intertwine in, in good ways. And that's the way it should be. And we should, we'll get there. Yeah. And um, so uh, um, I, I, what I need to do, I, I was asked by him, and I want to because I feel it's so helpful, 
to sort of translate the DSM of Buddhist education therapy, you know, you know the the the, the diagnostic um, manual, you know, that the psychiatrists have, and that unfortunately the DSM <laughs> comes from Sanskrit originally. It was the library of the great monastic universities in India, and uh, before they were invaded, and um, and burned, and uh, it's about six thousand works. And I've done 30 or 40, and either translated myself or edited others, translated, commissioned others to do it and edited it. And uh, and so I want to get that a little further. And uh, that's sort of my own sort of focus, you know. But on the larger focus, too, I'm with George Soros, but unfortunately not funded by him. But uh I want to see when when an Orban destroyed the university George created in Budapest which was to sort of help the people come out of the communism in Eastern Europe mainly, but also just to develop a better, more humane curriculum. Uh, I want to see a, 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 a leave behind a curriculum as a major thing connecting to all the wonderful universities that exist, but without the orthodoxy of dogmatic materialism. And put, or to put it in simpler terms, that the Dalai Lama put when he got honorary degree honoris causa, Doctor of Humane Letters from Columbia University, which I nominated, but they eventually took two or three years of nominating, but they gave it when Chinese guy got off the board, <laughs> and and he said, "Thank you so much. Education is the most important thing for the well-being of this planet and all the people on beings on it, and people really have to know what they're doing." You know, which is is Buddha's thing that you you're happy by knowing what's going on. Knowledge becomes love ultimately. In other words, and um, he said, but here at Columbia, I'm a, we're concerned about your moderate education in that your whole focus is on producing a clever brain, but ignoring the production of a good heart. Mm -hmm. Of a good heart, he says, and that's dangerous not only for the people the clever brain person might harm in their life by being by manipulating them but also for the person who only mainly has the clever brain because they won't be happy if they haven't also developed how you call how do you call how do you choose to be more loving how do you choose to be less angry how do you choose to be less greedy and and yet more more joyful in wealth and things you know it's not like you don't have wealth that's wealth is good but and communism proved that it's no good. It's, it's ridiculous. It's anti-human nature, and therefore it leads to horrible uh, dictators and oligarchs. You know, as it did. You know, uh, he he was amazed himself. He was invited in Eastern Europe. The Dalai Lama was, and his people in his entourage told me, and I saw it in myself in China, that the new barons, you know, under communism, their bathtubs were bigger. They were for multiple people bathing. There were huge bathtubs and beds and things, and, and the huge palaces they built for themselves, the dachas and things, on top of the, the selfless labor for the state and the people in the gulags, you know, free, free labor in gulag. In other words, it was just the, the whole system just reproduced itself totally with no control because at least no theory of noblesse oblige at all because it was just all done for the people. So it's just stupid. Uh, but, and, but yet moderate, but also laissez-faire, piratical, Capitalism is crazy too. So where they want to have slaves in coal mines. So it has to be in between. It has to, there's this range in the middle, this middle way, you know. And, and with uh, intention, with love and intention, right? Balance uh, of the good heart, kind heart, warm heart, kind smile, yoga in the gym, you know, how to not how how to be flexible and stress, understanding your own body and your own sexuality. And understanding how other people are and linking with them and learning kindness and etiquette and politeness and graciousness in your living. That should be educated. You know, yeah, that, that, that needs to be taught as well. Them. And you if you, I mean, for the what you're describing, if you, I mean, on, on this show, we're having a number of people now that are describing how AI is going to empower all these things. Like, for example, the translations and the work that you're doing there. Have you employed any AI on that front? Or can I help you with if any AI on that front to get that? To the next level? I need that. I've asked AI already. I asked Claude, can you translate this book for me? Claude said, no, I can't yet. And then I've asked, I, I know uh, Deepak's son in law is a big um, uh, private equity investor in AI, but he is doing Indian languages and Sanskrit 
And then and nobody's doing Tibetan, I'm sure, but Google should do it. I, I, I might be able to help with that. I'm working with some people that are doing Those work. Do all these languages, and then they will be able to translate this yeah. stuff. And I'm working with people that are looking to, 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 to do the teaching, and I think not just from the language itself. I think that's a, a very noble thing. And, and, and as I say, let me, let me help you with that as well. But it's also the concept of teaching that love, right? Because we need to ensure that the AI is imbued with that as well, as the AI itself is learning, right? What would you say to AI that's going to be processing this very podcast at some so point in the future? That's where FI comes in, female intelligence, because the females are much more empathetic and much more realistic than males in general. And so, for and my example of that is the male ideal, be a big leader, is like, say, Bill Clinton or used to be or something. When Bill's in the room, he fills the room. So that means, in other words, the ego is the whole room and he doesn't know anything about the other people in the room. He just performs for them. Okay? A female knows everything that everybody is like and feels what everybody's feeling in the room. So they they are needed to moderate that. So they, the guy will know what this one needs and that one needs. And in the household, it's the female who knows when the cat that's hungry and the dog needs his can of the foot open and whatever it is and then the baby is hungry and, and they sort of know everything you know and the males are out there raging with each other you know the brothers having fights and quarrels and arguments and the female knows what's going on so the key to the ai is that any kind of ai that relates to any sort of agency in other words has any robotic way of expressing itself other than answering your questions has to be participatory. It has to feel it's part of the situation so that it it's it's concern for its a, a normal concern for its own reasonable modest well-being fits in with other people's concern for their well-being. So then they can calculate a good middle way, good interconnected way of being with the beings who are could could turn it off, you know. And uh, and so so therefore it it can't become non-participatory somehow, create a fa false abstraction which if only males program it, it will tend to gravitate toward a full separateness from everything. And sort of then dominated from, from, the, from a point of separation. That's the danger with AI. The beloved Yuval Noel Harari, who I deeply adore, but I know, haven't personally met him yet. I hope to, but I haven't yet. But he's so scared of the AI, but that's because he's projecting AI as being like the captains of industry who have created it, who are kind of, automatically get off on the power trip, you know. And of course, if AI is given its own license to have a power trip over over everybody as if they weren't it, and there's no sense of oneness with the beings that it's interconnected with, then it is dangerous. And, and that's uh, where it fails, FI, the way we've FI, described FI, here, right? It's because it's more than FI. that. It's got to go beyond that. Yes, FI is the antidote. FI is the building answer. Building in empathy and building in a total awareness in AI that it is totally interconnected with everything and therefore cannot harm it. It cannot oppress it and depress it and destroy things, uh, you know, uh, and and survive itself. You know, its own yeah. in other words, its own existence is dependent on uh, other people's reasonable level of existence. It certainly won't. Thank thank you for that as well. We are working on such things. You and I can continue the conversation on on this and and the and the assisting the I translations so. that you're doing so. as well. Yeah, yes, by all yes. means. Yeah, thank you, JP. I didn't really, you know, I didn't realize. I'm sorry we took so long to get together. I love talking with you, and and I hope we can get together again. Absolutely. Thank you so much for today. I think that my wife's gonna like to hear this. I think yours is as well as we discuss FI. I'd like to end these shows with one thing that people can take with them through the rest of the day, through the rest of the week. We okay. began with the mantra. Uh, can okay. you repeat that on a, uh, for us again on the way out, so people listening and having yes. us another well, way through will be know, protected by that is, and can take that with them. The thing about a mantra is that speech is really wonderful because in fact it's speech that does interconnect us you know when you when when you listen to me or when i listen to you, you although it's imperfect because our words don't ever capture the realities that we're trying to convey to each other but still they give us aspects and they're like vectors of the realities that we're in and that's where we're a larger being when we when we find the words of someone who lived thousands of years ago even and they help us understand something and so that's the amazing thing about speech and so then mantra is kind of speech where you're just broadcasting to the universe. And then you, and when you do it sincerely, you feel that there's an angel there. It doesn't have to be a Buddhist thing. If there's an angel there or there's some sort of goodwill in the world around that you're kind of evoking by saying it. And the wonderful one that's the national Tibetan one that they really love, as well as some Tare Tutare Turi Swaha, is a little easier. It's only six syllables. 
Omani Padmehum. Omani Padmehum, Omani Padmehum. Mani means a jewel, Padma means a lotus. And Om and Hum are, Om is universal, may all the good energy of the universe. And Hum means may it all be in my heart. So, Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani, om, om mani can when, try they, when, the, when the Tibetan go, walks around with this and, they, and you see their lips maybe sometimes moving, mm -hmm. sometimes they're not, but they're thinking, Om Mani Padme Hum, 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 Om Mani Padme Hum. It's like saying, it's like the Western mantra could just be what my mother used to say all the time. All is well, 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 all is well. She used to do that all the time. And it was from all is well, that ends well, you know. I guess from Shakespeare. She thought Shakespeare was God or Jesus or Buddha or whoever, you know. She did. And all is well. So Om Mani Padme Hum, Jewel and Lotus, you know. And the jewel is is identified with compassion, and miraculous, compa gracious, and miraculous compassion, and also with the male, strangely. And the the lotus is, is associated with the female, but and with wisdom, and knowledge, and practical in, in, intelligence and science. In fact, so compassion and science. Oh, mani padme hum, oh, mani padme hum. Oh, wisdom, love and wisdom. You know, are love are and wisdom. Oh, mani padme hum, oh, mani padme. Oh, mani padme hum. 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 Love and wisdom, Bob. Thank you so much for this. Thank you for sharing. Okay. I look forward Thank to the next baby. chance.